Okay, welcome to the third edition of Political Differences and Civility, um, in which we will have a hopefully civil discourse um, on the topic, <laughs> Is America a Christian Nation? I have security locked in, so if there are any fisticuffs, I will immediately hit that button. Okay? Um, Dr. Jerryson won the toss. Dr. Jerryson from the uh, Philosophy and Religious Studies Department, and Dr. Adam Folder from Politics and International Relations. You may begin. So since I had the coin toss, I have the pleasure of introducing my reading that I had today and explaining the purposes of this. So the one I had was from Relating Religion by Jonathan Z. Smith. He is an eminent scholar who just recently passed away about a year ago uh, from the Academy who taught at University of Chicago for three, four decades. And in this reading, what Smith begins to do is one, to talk about some of the arguments he's made before. One, the fact is, is that we don't really have a definition for what religion is. But two, talking about where the power lies in defining religion in this country. And so on the first page, 375, but continue on to page 376, on the second page, he talks about and gets to the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS. After giving a long quote on the first page right here, he says, the Internal Revenue Service is both de facto and de jure, America's prime definer and classifier of religion. It reproduces the imperial Roman government's efforts at distinguishing licit and illicit religions as subtypes of a wider legal concern for distinctions between what's legal and what's legal associations. And this has to do with ideas of not-for-profit, right? What groups can claim that they can be not-for-profit? And by the way, uh, this is a big issue for the, um, uh, the uh, what is the group from Florida? Scientology, who for a long time appealed about being seen as religious because they didn't want to be taxed and became defined through our IRS as being religion. And he proceeds to talk about how, in, in the rest of this thing about Okay, now we're saying who's defining what religion is. Let's see how they deal with that. And he proceeds on to look at the Supreme Court and the decisions in that. And what I like what Smith does is he gives a very long, careful, thick, detailed description of an example and shows how that example can pertain to many other things. And looks at how the Supreme Court is distinguishing whether or not the Santeria, which is, in the words of Kennedy, a blending of Roman Catholicism and the African uh, Yoruba traditions is do what they do is religious or not? Is it exempt or protected under the First Amendment rights? And what he shows, I think, very carefully in his readings is that the ways in which they identify what is religion and what is not is based upon Christianity. So, for example, on page 382, he talks about what he calls um, in the first full paragraph of the quote, he says, what Justice Kennedy has undertaken in this initial statement of fact, or more properly data, that is to say, facts accepted by purposes of the argument, is an essay in familiarization, largely enabled by the deployment of a Christian prototype. By that he's saying that the Supreme Court has always used the Christian prototype as a means of seeing how much things will be similar to Christianity, and whether or not then it's seen as religion whether it's saying the terms church or ministry or so forth, it's always used in our legal documents. And that way, Christianity has become the norm. And this way, too, he talks about this in terms of the fact of not just all Christianity, but he says Protestant religion is the norm and looks at that, too. And so throughout the rest of this chapter, he looks at the ways in which our courts have always used Christian terms. And if you think about this, too, the first thing you put your hand on, the Bible, for your, when you're at the courts. Um, it says, under God, not gods, or atheism for the Pledge of Allegiance. So we have this throughout in a normalizing fashion, so that it's not about what beliefs are heard the most, but what Smith's saying, what's been normalized the most, and been executed by our court systems and the IRS, which for him is Christianity. I think it fit within the time frame. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so if I may say, um, and to discuss this too, I had the pleasure of journeying across the country uh, this summer. I, I drove with my family from Ohio through Indiana into Missouri. I got into uh, 
at this point, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, California. We then drove up into Oregon, Idaho, uh, Wyoming, Colorado, Montana. I uh, finally got into Illinois. What I saw throughout my travels was that the most biggest sites I saw were giant crosses in different states. And billboards about, saved, about being saved by Jesus. And I thought about the fact that if you had a symbol of Islam, that would be taken down that way. If you had a symbol about Buddhism, they wouldn't even know what it is, or Hinduism. That only one religion in this country gets this sort of credence without ever being thought differently about it, which is Christianity. Uh, and in that way, too, we can think about the fact that how many presidents we've had in this country that are non-Christian? Zero. But what I will say is this, though. We've only had one president who's been non-Protestant, which is John F. Kennedy, who's Catholic. But I will say this, though, that the idea of what is Christian has shifted over time. And it will always shift, because Christianity is not static. It's not monolithic. There are evangelicals, non-evangelicals. There's all different types of denominations in this country. That's different than thinking about the idea of the idea of Christmas and how it shuts down everything when it's Christmas time around here. It has a certain power and influence in this country that the Eid for Islam do not have, that Jews do not have for Hanukkah, that Hindus do not have for Diwali, or Buddhists have for other purposes too. So this shows to me that yes, we are still a Christian. I can yield that one minute to further discussion. Okay. Well, then it sounds to me like in this question of whether or not America is a Christian nation, we actually agree that it is. Um, where we disagree is probably in uh, my sense that, as the title of the piece I'm using by Clifford Orwin implies, Christianity in America is greatly unraveling, so we're not the Christian nation that we used to be. Um, so, what's that? Oh, I'm, t I'm talking about you right now. Oh, okay, all right, I get it. Uh, sorry, I was a little misunderstanding there. Okay, so, um, I agree with um, uh, Jonathan Smith, um, who uh, says that uh, we don't have a uh, single definition of what uh, religion in America means. Uh, but I think that that point is uh, able to be worked in, in both directions. For example, I was just talking in my uh, class just before uh, this discussion now about how uh, the ambiguities behind the language of the First Amendment uh, does not entirely tell us what any of those words really mean. And one of the words in it is the word religion. So Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise of religion. The problem with the fact that we don't have a single definition of religion is that we don't know how to apply that phraseology to real world circumstances which is what Jonathan Smith's point is, I think. Uh, and therefore, we make up uh, an interpretation based on a Christian prototype. That's his position. Um, the fact that we make up a uh, Christian prototype um, might even be a problem. In this sense, I might agree with him, but for different reasons. It might create a problem in that um, Religion could actually be defined as non-religion. It could be, at least from constitutional, uh, from a constitutional standpoint, it could be defined as atheism. If the premise behind the Constitution, in particular these two clauses of the First Amendment, is that we have the right of freedom of conscience, then our conscience could also tell us that there is no God and that there's no uh, metaphysical universe, all there is is the material, and therefore um, this First Amendment would have to protect that point of view as well, that come, that, or, or protect against even having that point of view being dominant, in which case you could actually make it, you could make a case that religion um, could even mean atheism, therefore if we take 
in God we trust off of our coins, or we remove in God, under God from our Pledge of Allegiance, or any other number of um, efforts to promote freedom from religion in this country, then what we're actually doing is still promoting a singular, um, a particular point of view, a point of conscience, which is that there is no spiritual transcendent existence of anything metaphysical in this world. I, I like what you're saying about the idea of atheism, uh, but let me ask you this before I respond yeah. to that, which is how would you define the difference between religion and theism? Okay, um, religion and theism. Well, uh, the theism, I think, has to have some sort of revealed source. Right? We, we know that to be true. Well, you're the religious studies expert, I'm not, right? <laughs> right? But isn't that the case, that it has to have some sort well, of revealed source? Well, theism doesn't need revealed source, uh, that's creedal, but um, theism implies a belief in higher in divinities, or uh -huh. a divinity. All right. So a theism is rejection of such mention. But I notice how you say non-religion and atheism, as you know, it's too stupid with definition of religion. Yeah. Non-theism doesn't mean you're not religious. It just means non-theism. But the thing too is well, that. Well, what's the difference between theism and deism then? Good. So deism, deos, is God, right? Uh -huh. Theism is the belief in uh -huh. the divinities. So, right. um, so I would just end with this saying that the pledge of allegiance with under God and on our money was only done in the 1950s. What's that? It was only made in the 1950s. So it's only been a recent in our country's history of those insertions into our language. Okay. But I guess we're out of time. Okay. Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong, but according to the rules you gave me, you're both now disqualified. <laughs> <laughs> because the second stage was five minutes to respond to number one, okay, which was Dr. Fuller responding to Dr. Jerry. Now there's five minutes for exchange between the two of you. Okay. And then we'll proceed to seven minutes for Dr. Fuller to oh. present his position. I took some time for you, so you go ahead. I, I'm sorry. I think I misunderstood the, yeah. the organization. Okay, so you want me to start my... Uh, no, so we're still doing this. We're still doing this. We're still oh, doing my reading. have five minutes to interact. Oh. With so okay. we should probably explain what the format is, because we didn't talk about this. So we're going to have my talk. five to seven minutes of me explaining my reading, and then uh -huh. Dr. Fuller then responds to my reading for a while. Then we have some exchange back and forth. And then Dr. Fuller will do five, seven minutes on his reading. I'll have my response to him, and then we'll have to exchange back and forth. Mm -hmm. So since it took a little time to end with your rebuttal to me yeah. on the reading, do you want to say anything after the reading before we have to exchange back and forth? Oh, uh, no, no, that's it. I'm actually curious to know where, how you would respond to my broader point, though, about uh, how this absence of a definition, that we have to let the IRS decide it for us. I think you're right in that, uh, one, by not defining religion, we always have the problems of then how do you apply it. And of course, in this country, there's legal and financial purposes for doing so. Uh, it's been charted that religious organizations and religious paraphernalia make over $1 trillion a year in this country. And so, what I'll say is this, though, is that oftentimes, our Supreme Court justices and those lawmakers think they're doing things about religion, but you can never operate in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. You're always drawing upon a religion to form these thoughts and ideas. And so by not doing this forefront and being transparent about it, they have unintentionally tacked on that Christian prototype as prized. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you have a Pledge of Allegiance, you should ask yourself, what's the allegiance in? Is it about the allegiance in the nation and mm -hmm. the government? In which case, why do you need to have religion in there at all? Why do we even have to have under God? Um, indivisible, and for all shouldn't be the case, although I question if it really is for all. I think we have racism in this country and so forth. But um, I would think that the insertion of religion actually pushes back against the idea of separation of church and state was developed not by our former framers of the Constitution, but by this person, Roger Williams, who was a Baptist minister at Rhode Island, who was the first one to say, uh, I'm a minority as a Baptist, don't make rules against Baptists, we should have a separation to keep these things apart. Um, and so we have this sort of cultural push ever since to make sure that we don't have one religious denomination pushing on others by trying to do this. But unfortunately, I think it's blood in anyway because like you're saying, we have not clearly defined what religion is. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you, do you disagree that, that 
that Christianity is the basis of our founding? I would agree that if you look at all the people who were largely all white males, who pretty much were allowed to be part of the framing of our Constitution and the Bill of Rights, if you look at their backgrounds, they all came from Christian backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Now, they're all different types of Christianity, though. A lot of them identified as deists. Mm -hmm. Deists, in this way, being that they believe that there was a God or Creator, but He left behind His mechanisms and He's not no longer overseeing it. Where others think, no, God is involved and in play and always involved in this sort of thing. So I think that absolutely Christians, Christianity was influencing every single person involved, even Jews and Jewish Americans and Muslim Americans who were, by the way, at the founding of our country. Um, but that Christianity was the pr pr dominant influence uh, in that way. Do you not think that your, I still have time, right? Uh, yeah. Do you do you not think that your um, uh, your your aptitude to or your tendency to uh, make the, to to question this uh, derives itself from Christianity, the, the, from the freedom that Christianity provides? Well, it's interesting you ask that. Uh, the idea of secular, the idea of the uh, of, uh, the absence of a predominant religion affecting certain things, is found in different countries. There's Nehruvian secularism in India, the king was born of Hinduism. Uh, there is a form of secularity found in Islam that came out in Indonesia. And we see a sort of secularism being born out of Christianity's country. In no way do I say that I'm immune from the conditioning of Christianity's country. I'm in this country, I've been around it. It certainly has affected me, absolutely. Um, but I would not say the idea to argue against or think freely of certain of things derives from Christianity since the Ashokan pillars that were Buddhist the Edicts of Tolerance under uh, um, the uh, Islamic rulers, the Mughal rulers, reflects that this is beyond Christianity. Okay. Uh, I think we're out of time for this particular side. Right? I, don't, I can't shore this up in 20 seconds. Okay. So, Dr. Fuller, you now get five to seven minutes to present your position. Okay. All right. So, uh, this is the Unraveling of Christianity in America by uh, Clifford Orwin. Uh, who's a political theorist at the University of Toronto, although I think he's an American uh, that just happens to teach in, in Canada. He's in Chicago. What's that? He's in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the, the premise is that uh, America was founded as a Christian nation, so I agree with you on that, but with the caveat that uh, Christianity in America uh, represents more of a civil religion than a particular mode of, of, of worship, than, than, than particular rituals or, or a, a description of what exactly the essence of God is. It's more of a political, civil idea, mentality that defines our civilization that we could clearly see from our very first governing document, the Declaration of Independence. It says in it that uh, references the nature and nature's God, the separate of equal station between the powers of the earth and nature and nature's God, and that we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and so the notion of there being a creator, uh, a particular deistic being, uh, is quite front and center in our foundational document. And in fact, Clifford Orwin makes the point that uh, of all the wars that America has found itself in, the only one that's truly a holy war is really the Civil War, because that was over uh, the, uh, or from Lincoln's point of view, over the defense of this civil religious framework. Um, so uh, because of that, and this kind of goes to what I was saying at the last question I had for you, uh, things like democracy, freedom, liberty, etc., or at least the American versions of those things, um, although I don't necessarily want to limit it to just the American versions of those things, but those concepts in general are outgrowths of a Christian civilization of which the Declaration of Independence is its basis. Um, but not only is democracy and freedom uh, the, the outgrowths of those things, so is the, the actually the opposite of freedom, but rather restraint. Uh, freedom and license are not the same things, although we often uh, mix them up or, or, or confuse the two or, or conjoin the two. Uh, our civil religion 
which is based largely around Christianity, um, teaches our citizens the difference between freedom and license. And that's really the main point. And in our first dialogue, uh, one of your, re your reading referenced uh, Tocqueville. Tocqueville made this point about how he toured America in the 19th century. He saw people, you know, townspeople, village people, in their churches and in, here, in practicing a civil religion, this is what kept people moral. And this is the, and Weber also in Protestant uh, ethic and the spirit of capitalism makes a similar point. Um, so uh, Orwin's premise though is that even though that is our civil religion or how America was, it's, our civil religion was founded, the seeds of this civil religion, or that is the seeds of Christianity are unraveling and the, uh, the seeds of that unraveling really do derive from Christianity itself because of its uh, focus on uh, the notion that uh, you're free to interpret things as you see fit, or in particular Protestant Christianity, that you could be your own clergyman and you can and just read your own Bible and interpret things as you think they should be interpreted. So uh, what we have then is an unraveling. We now have uh, the rise of uh, a pushback against uh, our civil religion. Uh, the progressives, uh, were, even though they were largely uh, motivated in the early 20th century by their own Christianity, by their own Christian faith, over time the progressives became defenders of sort of anti-religion counterculture. And so what we now have in America is this deep divide between, on one hand, traditionalists and progressives, which is the quintessential uh, uh, culture war. And even within this culture war, Orwin's point is that even religion itself, in particular Christianity itself, has become liberalized and modernized as well to the point where often don't even notice much of a difference between people who understand themselves being uh, traditionalists versus those who understand themselves being progressives. He makes a really interesting point, which is one of the, at the time that this article came out, uh, made, made the, it became kind of well known because of this point. Uh, he makes the, because this was written in the midst of the Iraq war, so uh, he makes the point that even a, a very pious man like George W. Bush, who was, you know, he's known for being one of our most religious presidents in the last hundred years. Um, he, nobody actually separated church and state more than George W. Bush by uh, his uh, insistence that uh, Christianity is not the precondition for democracy and that democracy can be uh, carried anywhere. And in other words, uh, he did not believe that, that uh, civil religion is necessary for the preservation of uh, free government. So uh, what we see now happening is that um, with the last couple of, of presidents, we see, uh, or and not just presidents, but eras that these presidencies revolve around, is that we no longer seem to be willing to accept uh, the premise that there are certain things like the Declaration of Independence, that there are sacred things, there are beautiful things that are the basis for our political norms and our political values, which is why you have something like uh, George Bush uh, not really being as serious about his Christianity as people think, and Trump supporters, right, who uh, would back in the 90s criticize you know, Bill Clinton for personal transgressions, but now just don't seem to care. Right? I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'll do is I think I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through how I engage with the reading and talk about my reactions to it. Okay. Uh, now, I want to point out that these both were published in 2004. So both mine and mm -hmm. Dr. Fosher's in 2004. As he says, during the, the middle of the Iraq War. Um, now, what I find interesting is Orwin uses a lot of charged language, but not any substantiations or sources for what he's saying. He uses a lot of anecdotal evidence about he's seen or heard what he's watched in his articles. Let me point out to some of these. And also, the, the, the very wise tweaking generalizations he makes. The first paragraph, Rosen's been reduced to an option. 
when was voting not an option? How has it been reduced? Who's done it? Right, it, but it's alarmist. It continues on. The unprecedented variety of votes life in America today, is it more today than it was before? How is he charting that? How is he proving that? Does it show it? It reflects the influx of all these non-Christian faiths. So I sense that it's invading, this influx is taking place here. And he talks about the fact that, look, in New York, you have over 200 languages spoken in New York today. Well, that's been the case for over 200 years, and languages do not necessarily mean anything about religion. But I can go on, too. He has so much concern on the next page about the full integration of Muslims into liberal society, as if there's a problem with Muslim Americans. And Amir Hussein's written a whole book about how Muslim Americans have been part of the United States from before the Constitution onward, and has had no problems with this. But it shows a fear nonetheless. He talks about the great non proletarian cultural revolution the 1960s. Of course, inserting there a classist view of these things. Uh, making it, but this is, of course, not about, he's talking about the immigration that was allowed. And so we allowed, it in the Immigration Act, people who were prevented from coming to this country ever before. And this is why we have what's called great brain draining, which we had doctors and lawyers from all around the world brought in, and they had to work as dishwashers and open laundromats because of this. But brought huge, so much more education to this country, but also more variety for a while. But we've had always instances of this. The Chinese worked the railroads, kicked out afterwards. Japanese Americans in here, Hindus six fought in World War, and so forth. But he has a lot of mistakes in this, too, uh, which gets me very concerned about this. He quotes Nietzsche and his views about religion, but this is from the late 1800s in Germany. And I don't know why he's trying to talk about the unraveling Christianity today in the United States. And he gets a little bit far beyond that. Um, he talks about the idea of, on page 27, he says, in Tocqueville's day, which in this respect lasted until mine square from Chicago, not everyone in America believed in Christianity, but everyone deferred to it no longer. Where's this evidence that they no longer deferred to it? There is no evidence for this. Since for the first time in our nation's history, Bush's opinion does not inhibit society as a whole. And I won't bother to document this claim, meaning he's not documenting this claim at all. Um, now, he also talks on the next page, 28, on the last paragraph. The only religion that my evangelical relatives regard as satanic is New Age religion. That's first off incorrect. Evangelicals have argued that first off there is Satanism in this country. So they call Satanism also satanic. Um, they call atheists satanic uh, for this too. There is quite a lot of things that some evangelicals, but notice he treats evangelicals in a wide generalization. Evangelicals, one of the different types of evangelicals in this country, and there has been always. And in fact, it wasn't until the 1970s, through the more majority coinage of Jerry Fowle and others, that you had the conservative Christians married to evangelicals in a political venue, uh, which he doesn't talk about here either. Um, and let's see, otherwise, and so what he asked on page 30, will that minority, is this minority of those who think of morality ever be a majority? And of course, he never even talks about the more majority how it was cultivated and developed, how it became a linchpin for Reagan winning in the 1980s and so forth. It uh, leaves it out completely. Um, and on page 31, that he says that liberalism is a matter of faith, not reason. Uh, while this is not his view, it's Richard Rorty's, the fact that he's giving space to suggest the fact that he is very biased, because I think that all ideologies involve faith, and all ideologies involve reason. But they cut one off for saying it's just all faith, not reason, very slanted. Finally, last but not least, on page 34, he says, only civil war can be seen as quasi-religious. Absolutely wrong. Philip Jenkins wrote a book about how World War I became religious and how the U.S. was involved in this. If you think of the war in Vietnam, Nixon cited religion as a reason of why we to intervene to stop the, the atheist Congress from getting involved here. The revolution used religious language as well about this two breaking off. In fact, every war we've been in has infused religious rhetoric to explain even the Iraq war with, with Bush talking about being good Christians in this way. So at this point, we're going to get, I guess, to our back and forth. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, there's a lot there to, to take in. Um, sounds like you took issue with a lot of it. <laughs> uh, so you, you were saying before that you were uh, touring the country a lot, and you noticed a lot of the uh, everything being Christian. But doesn't that derive from the fact that 
we have a Christian majority, and we always have. And my question, I'm trying to sort of wrap my mind around exactly what your objections are, because I'm not sure that we can really deal with your specific you know, points about Orwin's peace. What exactly are you afraid of by Christianity having dominance in our culture? Well, first of all, I'm not saying I'm afraid. Um, my concern is this, we're creating these anti-Sharia laws in states in which you know, Sharia literally just means Islamic law is interpreted by the ulama, which means you're going to have varieties in each country of what that is. But you never see any state saying, we're never going to have Christian law enacted here. It's just, it always about the other ones not. So it's, it seems to encourage a sort of antagonism, and I fear it should be there. So I'm like that. And the unraveling of Christianity in this, the United States, the biggest issue is the fact that, no, I think what's happening is Orwin's idea of what is, it should be Christian in unraveling. But we've always going ahead a Christian majority, but Christianity has always changed. I think it's still changing, but Orwin doesn't like the changes, and instead of saying he doesn't like it, he says that Christianity is unraveling. But we fight against, people fight against Christian law all the time. Yes, I agree, because they argue that it should be a separation. So you have some Christians who believe that church just should be at home and not outside, or others think, yeah. no, Christianity should be pushed into every vessel of our society. And those are different views within Christianity. So. You have people who are Christian fighting against pushing Christianity in laws. Not because they're against Christianity, but because they want to have that, that buffer. I'm not sure, what, I'm not going to follow what you mean by a buffer. They would like to have, here's an example of this too, right? We've seen this shift prior to the 1970s in which Christianity is something you practice in the home. You're good Christians in the home. You go to church, that's fine. I take the objection to the fact that going to church means you're moral, by the way, but that's anything. Um, but then it became a thing of, no, to be Christian means to get out there into the limelight to make sure your politicians use Christianity, to make sure education is beginning to have more Christianity in the schools, that you get rid of the idea of Darwinism in schools, you put the Christian gospels into the schools, and so that's a way of pushing it into the public sphere. Where some Christians say, no, no, the public sphere should have sort of either this diversity of religious views or an absence of any overt religious views. And so those are the differences taking place. But again, I think we should say they're Christian or non-Christian. You have Christians on both sides here saying this. Right, but Orwin says that too, though. Right. Uh, but the difference is that Orwell thinks, Orwin thinks that Christianity is unraveling. When in fact, it's not unraveling. I think what it is is that you're having, non, you're having unraveling of a white <laughs> Christianity that's conservative that has its linchpins and everything, and that's changing, and they don't like the changes. But that's something different. Is any Christian is unraveling? But I, I mean, it is unraveling. I think he makes this a case here that's strong. Any, any, just about any Christian uh, organization is more liberal and more modernized today than it would have been 30 years ago or 50 years ago. It, it's just that if everything becomes more uh, in in league or, or in tune with a with a society that that demands greater freedom. So in a way, the progressives are, are succeeding in this culture war. That's Orwin's point. All right, well, I know we're almost out of time, but with this we're over to you yeah. guys, but I'll just say this, that um, I understand that point, and I think some organizations are getting more progressive. That's not in any ways unraveling Christianity, but that's just changing in political theology. But I'll say also that we've had an outgrowth of conservatives in this country with Christianity huge output. The Christian Reconstruction Movement has grown tremendously through homeschooling and many things here. Yeah. And on top of that, too, you have growth of the skinheads. And in, in, in uh, Minnesota, too, the pushing and merging of Norse Odinism with Christianity, too, for a very conservative measure. So mm -hmm. it's not like you just have progressives mm -hmm. sweeping across. Things are changing, but it's not the same as changing when it comes to Christianity leaving. It's about the political perspectives. But changing. he means, let me just let wrap up with this, that he means the civil religion of Christianity is unraveling. I don't know if I agree with that, but let's, okay. let's, mm -hmm. I'd like to hear from you now okay. about the things you've raised or things that you think have not been raised. Um, mm -hmm. well, first of all, the, the framer of the Declaration of Independence, is Thomas Jefferson was sort of a closet atheist. He had his own, he had his own Bible. Yeah. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, the Jefferson Bible. So, so in order to have a society that functions, we have, we have to have certain morals and ethics that's universal, that transcends mm -hmm. all religion. 
you talk about religion, but you didn't talk about the spiritual side of it, how the spiritual side of your religions is interwoven with your laws and everything else. Mm -hmm. Where in the Constitution does it say, say Christ, Jesus, or any? It says God. God is Christian, and God is also Muslim. So. Well, actually, the Constitution doesn't say God at all. Okay. But, but the Declaration of Independence does. Okay. Yeah. Does, does it say Christ, Christian? No, it doesn't. It doesn't actually. It doesn't even say. It, well, it, it says Creator, Creator, and it says God in the in the okay. Declaration. Right. Yeah, it, that should be acceptable for anybody. Well, that's the. Well, but well, it, it can't be acceptable for 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 uh, for pagans. Well, here, what is Hindus and all that. So, right? well, actually, Hindus believe in a God, and most Hindus believe in one God. So, we're for Hindus, <laughs> but a lot of Buddhists don't believe in that. You have that. You have atheists don't believe in that, because uh, the atheism. Right? Um, there's Confucians who don't believe in that. Um, so Taoists believe in many gods. So the idea of being for all when you have a cre like one creator, or even believing in creator, because giants believe in gods with no creator, um, doesn't, isn't inclusive. It shows how we're always using the Christian pro type of thinking. It could include all, but when we learn about our religion, we realize, oh, it's not including these. But, is, the, but is there a religion that would not accept this might go along with your point, that would not accept the second tablet of the Decalogue. Which would be what? Which would be like basic things like do not murder, do not steal, do not yes. bear yes. false yes. witness, yes. those yes. kinds of things. Well, do not bear false witness. Is do not, not lie. Uh, I'll say this, that the last six <coughs> commandments, I'll say the majority <coughs> of the United States don't even can even list what they are. <laughs> and that you're not killed, so that you're not murder, by the way. Um, that Every religion I'm aware of adheres to some of these, but these last six have a lot to do with neighbors in the Abrahamic religion. Mm -hmm. Whereas other religions don't even make it about neighbors. It's just blanket statements of no lying, no stealing, mm -hmm. no harming of others, uh, and a restriction usually having to do with intoxication in some way or sexual misconduct. That is, um, I think, very general, uh, but it doesn't need a institutional religious designation. That's the game back to your question of spirituality. Basically, morals and ethics. Right. Mm -hmm. So morals and ethics can exist without institutions, and they have. And <coughs> I think it has in this country as well, too, because I would say this. To say that you can go to church to be moral, or you have to be a theist to be moral, says that an atheist is immoral, which I think is not true. not true, because there are a lot of atheists that are not, in, like I said, I don't, I don't by the way, care if there's a God, personally. Yeah. So if they're going to say that I'm now immoral because of that, well, but, but even even Jefferson did not say you have to go to, I mean, he said that these things are self-evident, right? You don't need God for it, right? But God helps. See, my problem is when they force me to celebrate Christmas, okay? Mm -hmm. That's bringing the spirituality into your laws then. Mm -hmm. You force somebody to do an act or do not an act because yeah. of a religion. Mm -hmm. yes. And I don't, I don't see that happening. In yeah, I don't see that happening. I'm, I'm a Jew, and I don't get forced to celebrate Christmas. Okay, well, we have a person who's going in the back, but I'll just say this, though. Uh, what I've been arguing is that there's been a soft power in place in this country, not a hard power. For example, my children go to school in public schools here, and they live in Warren, and they had homework talking about Santa Claus and being hired by Santa Claus and doing Christmas and all that. But you know what? The same time as Hanukkah, not lip service to Santa Hanukkah. Nothing about Eid. Kwanzaa. Or Hinduism. What's that? Kwanzaa. Or Kwanzaa. Mm -hmm. And so this is, for me, a soft influence of pushing. So my kids will come home and say, oh, what about God, Dad? I'm like, which guy are you talking about? And they're like, oh, we don't know. Because it's so normalized and so pervasive that it has an influence in and of itself. In the far back. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you both for coming. Uh, I don't know you very well. And Dr. Fuller, please don't take this out of my grade. <laughs> when you spoke about it, sir, it seemed like you were Which, making points. It's more uh, you. Okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't get your name. Jerryson. Oh, Jerryson. Dr. Jerryson. When you spoke about it, it seemed like you were speaking more culturally, and I do agree with the, the power plays. So that doesn't make it necessarily make us a Christian country, because sometime in our past, Christians got their things put into our law or in our words. But I think even Dr. Fuller would agree that so uh, socially speaking and culturally speaking, yes, we're kind of Christian nation, at least the majority. What I take a little problem with, Dr. Fuller and, and sir, uh, it seems like 
you didn't speak about the legal. This is a little flip flop. I thought you would be arguing, obviously, for religious, uh, you know, uh, in here, and, and he would be arguing against. But you didn't come at him like he said, Declaration of Independence, and he got around to it that it doesn't say God the Constitution. As far as I know, sir, the Declaration of Independence is just a letter to King George saying it's a old white guy. We're not going to take it. I love that question. I can respond to it. It's what we are governed by. It does not say that. All right. That's a, by the way, it's a great points here. Mm -hmm. well, let me address the first. So I think you're right in saying that I was arguing cultural, but I also argued through Smith that it's been state, federally supported through the IRS and so forth, and that the Christian prototype has been there and been enforced. Uh, but when we talk about a nation, and this is something that Benedict Anderson argues, a nation the idea of natio, nation, was pretty much formed in the late 1800s, early 1900s. The idea of nation, as we understand today, didn't exist before this. Um, and Anderson argues it involves the idea of it being invisible, limited, and sovereign. So the idea that you can't see all the Americans in this room, but that's why it's invisible. You have to imagine they're all there. It's limited because not everyone can be an American. It's sovereign because not everyone can be an American. But when we think of this, though, we think about what does it mean to be an American, I would argue implicitly in that imagination is thinking they're Christian. Right or wrong, it's that, that, that implicit association. And when I travel to other countries, they assume, when I tell them I'm from the United States, that I'm Christian. So nation has within it, I think, that property for a Christian nation of the imagination of the people that's been fueled by cultural and legal purposes. Yes, uh, the Declaration of Independence is not just a letter to King George telling him we're out of here. Uh, it's a letter to all tyrants. If it was just a letter to King George, then it would be nothing but a historical curiosity hung in museums and no reason for us to read. It tells us what our moral foundation as a nation is going to be, a natural law that our civil law has to adhere to. Abraham Lincoln made the same exact point, which is why Orwin's point is that civil war was a uh, holy war. Uh, Lincoln made the point in his Dred Scott speech that the phrase, all men are created equal, was placed in the Declaration not to affect the separation with England, but for future use so that future tyrants don't have a leg to stand on. No civil law can be moral if it violates the Declaration's basic principles. Well, you have two hands up, there's three hands, I think four, okay. Like Jake, and then, sir, you can go again. Third, fourth, okay. This fellow here has been waiting. Oh, he's in Philly? Oh. Caleb, you've been waiting? Yeah, he, he's been waiting. Okay, so I'm sorry, Caleb, we'll start with you then, Caleb. Okay, so, uh, for <coughs> Professor Fuller, when you say a civil religion, do you mean like that Christianity is the formal religion of the United States? Uh, no, I don't mean it's the formal. I mean it's uh, it forms the basis of a uh, cultural, political ethos. So it forms the basis of like uh, all of our documents. Is what you're saying? Like our our documents. Like as in the our, <coughs> our civilization. Right? Our, so our, yeah. In Article 11 of the Treaty of Tripoli, it states that the United States of America was not a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't that go against your entire claim? No, not necessarily. Uh, we're, not a, we're not established as a Christian nation, which is what the Treaty of Tripoli is referring to. We're not established in the sense that we don't have something like England has with the Anglican Church, where we have to fund a... A, a, as taxpayers, a, a, an official religion where our, our, our leader doesn't get to pick the head of any one particular uh, house of worship. Like the prime minister gets to decide who the Archbishop of Canterbury is. We sever church and state in that sense. But this does not mean that Christianity doesn't form the basis of our cultural norms, our cultural values, our activities. Um, certainly, I, I don't think it, the, the Treaty of Tripoli uh, violates that at all. So, um, this was a very good conversation, but I think it focused a lot on the descriptive, So, which the question was descriptive, it was, is the U.S. a Christian nation? But I want to shift a bit to the normative of audit being, 
So I guess the open-ended question that I have for both of you is just, is there any room for Christianity or any religion to actually influence public policy? When we're talking about public justification, can those justifications be religious, or do they have to be secular? And this touches on a lot of the same things as, as the first well, I just have one quick response. It's impossible to, to make it secular. Every, every politician brings their own values to, their, to the job when they go to legislate. And so you can't sever religion from values. So it, you're, that's my, my answer. And I'll in some ways agree in that Bruce Lincoln, a scholar, wrote that he thinks the best way to think about it is that you can be either minimalistic or maximalistic in how important religion is in your life. I mean, treating a minimal way, saying that you're just going to do it in certain ways at certain times. Maxwell says it has to be every part of my life. I will pray before I eat, and only the food that says my religion can eat. I won't talk to certain people that I'm allowed to talk to according to my religion, right? So there's a spectrum there. And what I think is that you can never get off the spectrum, but you can negotiate where the spectrum you'll be in that way. And that's the important thing. And I think for me, you should go on the minimal side for the government because that allows more inclusivity is what I think. Any uh, time for a follow-up? Well, we have other okay. people. Uh, so wait. Okay. Thank you. So you sort of already answered my question a little bit in responding to Jacob here. But my question was, when you were, um, Dr. Jason, when you were talking about the Constitution and the, and, and it has to be, um, you know, the um, thing about religion um, that everyone has the right to. But you said you were talking about how Christians, some today, are trying to even more separate out Christianity from the public sector. Do you think that there, and this is for both of you, is there a push by some to have our laws go from having a right to religion to a right of worship? Being the book, because right of worship and right of religion are two different things. And right of worship being, you can worship in your home, at your church, but don't bring it into the public square. But religion is you have that right to freely exercise it in your public duties and in your life in the public. Do you see that in today's society? You go. I think first off, Josh, that's a very great question. The distinction between right uh, to worship versus right to exercise your religion. Uh, what we have to be careful of here is that the Constitution, uh, when people begin to interpret, they use the words very carefully. It says, uh, practice your religion. Worship is also, unfortunately, not very inclusive because, for example, Buddhists will not say they worship anything. Some do, but very few do. And there's 1.3 billion people in the world that practice Buddhism by other people. So they'll say, look, we venerate and we respect these statues, but we don't worship them or worship these other gods in this way. Atheists would not worship, right? They would never use it that way. So again, we're still using in some ways I think Christian prototype in trying to use these terms. Now, I think perhaps your question could be a good way of explaining the minimalistic aspect, right? Of allowing what you can do in those ways. But I would try to have us try to use words that would be inclusive in doing so. I never really thought about it. I'd have to think, that's why I was hesitant to answer this, but I, I, I've never really thought about religion and, and worship being separate concepts, but you've given me something to, to think about. Yeah, so I would say about spiritualism, and what I was talking about is, uh, we was telling you something about the uh, unraveling of Christianity. Well, nowadays, you have a more informed public. You have all kinds of media that educational as far as anything that you want under the sun. Mm -hmm. And the more informed you are, the more discriminative you are on what you accept to be the truth mm -hmm. and what you don't accept to be the truth. Mm -hmm. So this unraveling may not be a bad thing. It could also be a good thing because you get down to more honesty, what's, what's really real, what's not real. And people will see it and, say they, and they're hesitant to go either way on, on all of this way or that way, they're more balanced, they're more descriptive on what they believe, what they say. Well, because basically, religion is a public control device. Mm -hmm. Okay? I don't agree with that. I do. Uh, I don't yeah. see how you can. <laughs> I don't see how you can. It's, it's, uh -huh. it's a matter of control. You can't, nobody can prove anything either way about any of it. 
okay? It is what you've been brainwashed and taught through the ages to, to accept what your parents teach you. Uh, I bought it this way. I'm a more or less go that way. As the tree is bent, so okay. shall it grow. All right, Mike. So the famous scholar Charles Long said this about religion in this way. He says that religion controls our experiences. And by that he means this. You get into a car accident, you're a Christian, you survive miraculously, you will thank God for it because mm -hmm. your religion has controlled how you interpret the experience. But a Buddhist might get an argument and go, oh, it's my karma. Mm -hmm. And so that way, religion controls how we experience it. And, and then that way, too, I think you need to think about how other people can begin to use it in more forceful ways. And I'm not sure if this is what you were arguing with. That's part of it. I mean, I can get behind the way you just described it, okay? but the, the, I don't agree that it's some sort of mind control tool that's used for uh, for, for you know, purposes you of maintaining the power of elites. Moses saw a burning bush out in the desert. Right. So he saw a burning bush in the desert. <laughs> All right. Basically, we got other questions, but I will, I will say though, that I, I don't agree with the first premise either that that people are more informed today. Or there's more, yes, they are. There, there's more information, right? But it's uh, bogus information. Well, now, it's I'll, always been. I, I will <laughs> echo in this way: this Prothero says this thing called religious literacy. He's found this country has a very low religious literacy. They can't name the four gospels or the first book of Genesis. <laughs> the most famous Bible verse quoted in Congress is. Um, God, don't ask, uh, don't ask for God's help to do it yourself, more or less. Which actually is something Benjamin Franklin said, not the Bible. <laughs> but our biblical, but our Congress people don't even know that. So, whether they reach out there or not, in my view, they don't really get religion. But, uh, Jacob, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just, I, I wasn't 100% satisfied with the answer to Jacob's question. And I thought I might try to rephrase it as I thought I understood it. Which is... We're seeing a lot of cases today in the media where religion is used uh, by public figures and private figures to either refuse services to other people. So the famous case of them, I think she was in one of the Dakotas, where she refused to give a marriage license to a gay couple despite the fact that federal law mandated her to. That was Kentucky. That was Kentucky. Kentucky, right? And then, and then, and then we are, could look at uh, Quebec right now, which is that we passed laws against wearing religious symbols in public, which disproportionately affects Muslims, and it's aimed at Muslims, but also Jews, and sometimes Christians, and perhaps others. That's, I think, the question. And how, is that play, how does that play out within a Christian structure where, where, where a certain primacy is given to Christian perceptions of what is religious and what is not religious, whereas Muslim dress is actually often ethnic dress, right? And, and we can have certain questions about that. Yeah, I mean, that's... That, that's a fair point. I, I do actually agree with you. Um, so uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, things during the holiday season are, are, are permitted for Hanukkah, but not permitted for, for, for Christmas. This has happened in, in some, some cases. Like there was one in like the Massachusetts Capitol building some years ago. Uh, a, a, a tourist wanted to know, where is there a Christmas tree or a nativity scene? There's none around. But there was a Hanukkah menorah. And the tour guide, I guess, explained that this Hanukkah menorah is um, not religious, it's cultural. Right? It, but, but a Christmas tree or a nativity scene would be religious. So in that sense, I mean, this is the sort of thing where it can work in both directions. Well, I'll say that's an example of lack of religious literacy with knowing that. Uh, yeah, and I true, think what yeah. we've done is we see, you go to the grocery stores. Here in Youngstown, you'll see the ethnic food aisle. What does that mean to say ethnic food people? You think about it, ethnic is since it's not normative. It's not what we see as American. But you know what? Mexican food is just as American as other foods because we've allowed Mexican Americans in this country for before we even formed this so country. So how would you categorize it? So my issue is this. <laughs> First off, I would not categorize it. I would simply have the foods out where they belong. So how do I find the matzo? Go to where the crackers are. <laughs> 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 but that's what all the bread is crackers. Anyway, this is my example about how we have we have always had this norm of identity in this country that seems to be invisible and seems that's what's considered generic and norm, and when it's not fitting that norm, it's suddenly different and has to be called ethnic as a polite way of saying it's different. When in fact we've always been diverse in this country. But well, we have not aired it out. And the only unraveling I see happening is getting those people's voices suddenly louder and more visible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
So, I just got the last question, by the way, because we're almost yeah. out of time. So, it's just like, his unraveling that he talked, that Orwin talks about, to me seems, as a Christian, that it's coming from a Christian perspective that I don't know what side to pick, because both sides are pulling from the extremes, saying, God's telling me to do this, but the other side's telling me to go this way, and I get stuck in the middle. So I think that's where, to me, is Orwin's talking from a Christian lens. I don't think he's Christian, actually. I, to me, that's where I think he's talking, is a Christian lens, and I'm stuck in the middle in confusion, not knowing because there's no Christian hegemony anymore. Not that that's a bad thing. So I'm sorry, what's the question? Or you can have a comment too. Yeah. Okay. That, it was, well, I mean, I, the, yeah. the question is, if that's not what he's, if the unraveling isn't from a Christian perspective, where is it coming from? Good. You're saying you're not Christian. Where is this point perspective coming from? Where is the determination? Oh, what's the danger? What's the coming? Where's it from? What's the origin? Where, 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 what perspective what, is coming from? What perception from? is the unraveling from if it's not from a Christian? Oh, perspective? Yeah, the, the perception is from someone that believes in the preservation of the civil religion. So, uh, he's, he's a Straussian. Right? It's hard for me to really go into. Uh, what exactly that means, I'm not so sure myself, but I am one. Uh, but uh, he believes that it's important for civilizations to have a common purpose, to believe in something that they commonly believe to be sacred. And this is unraveling. That's his main point, yes. No, wait, 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 I'm sorry. We're, we're, unfortunately, we're out of time at okay, this point. Right. We're going to have another debate in a month. It's going to be on the left. The yeah. question is... The question is, has the left moved left? Yeah. That's, the question. That's going to be the debate we'll have yeah. next month.